Seated next to me, just across the table from our microphone, is Mr. Fred Vesteris, who is one of the world's most famous dancers, a real hoofer from the word go. Fred? How do you do, Mr. Scott? It's a great pleasure to be with you folks this afternoon. Pleasure to have you at our WRC microphone, Fred. Thanks, thanks. How long have you been dancing, Fred? Oh, about uh, ten years professionally. Ten years professionally? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I imagine when you were just a youngster, your mother used to take you to the old vaudeville houses, and you'd watch some of the great dancers of your time, and uh, this inspired you to become a dancer, no, right? No, nothing like that, no. What's the story on your dance? Well, I uh, used to listen to the radio and hear all these dance studios advertising, you know, you get six free lessons if you call now. Yeah. So I called all the dance studios, took the free lessons, and moved on to the next one. So uh, ten years and about ten dance studios later, I'm a pro. Gee, uh, how many uh, free lessons do you figure you acquired? Approximately $200,000 worth of free lessons. You really made out like a tall dog in a briar patch. Sure pad. did, yes, sir. Quite a hoofer, aren't you? Yep. Well, uh, do you have special dance shoes made for your dance? Uh, oh, yes, I have the uh, special dance shoes with the cleats on them and... Uh, uh, you know... Uh, that Buster Brown thing on your shoe is just a laugh. Yes, uh, that's that's just for kicks, you know, just a yes. <laughs> sort of a little yeah. deceiving thing. <laughs> Actually, go to Kenny's, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. All right. Well, uh, anyway, uh, maybe you'd like to uh, demonstrate to our WRC listeners the first rudimental step in learning to tap dance. Yeah, maybe. Would you like to do it? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, would you do it? Oh, let me uh, get up here. <clears throat> just, uh, this is the... Well, this pick up on radio, I mean, uh, you know... Well, this shows your hat, but maybe the interview will Okay, help. this is just a simple, basic uh, uh, tap dancing step here. Very good. He's going to do it. There you go. I'm sure that if you could see this, you'd probably appreciate it a little more, although the sound was very distinct. I hope that they could get something out of it, yes. Can you give us now a little more uh, tempered, uh, a little more advanced step? Let's yeah, this is what we call a triple toe tap. Triple toe uh, tap. Yeah, okay. I got Very the holy good. feet in town. He used to play with the Howard Kemp Orchestra years ago. I noticed the uh, shades of I've got a date with an angel yeah, on there. Yeah, skinny, I've got the date with an angel. Okay, yeah, that's uh, fine. Got the meter at seven. Do you have any exclusives yourself? Anything that you do as a specialty uh, act? When you yes, I have something that I don't think any other dancer has done. What's that? On the stage. That is to dance on the top of a regular bass drum. You dance on a bass drum? Yes, a kettle drum, I guess you'd call it, yes. Well, you can call it anything you want to. I call it magnificent. Thank you. I'd like to demonstrate that for you. We've got the drum right here. I see. Yeah. Wheel it okay. in, boys. Okay. okay. Now then, I just hoist myself up on top of this drum here. Gee, this is really going to be interesting. I wish and, you could uh, see this, folks. Uh, now then, you notice I don't have too much of an area in which to work here. I'm sorry we couldn't afford a band to provide you some music. I am, too. It's a pretty chinchy interview, I think. But, uh, have to ad-lib the dance you know, uh, Well, I'll do it unaccompanied. Okay. Is this a fancy dance? Oh, this is a real a... fancy one. Stand All back right, and give me air here. Okay, we're okay. watching. The... That's wonderful. Gentlemen, we've had a little problem here, apparently. Something. What's the matter there, Fred? Where was the sky? What's the matter? The head just fell off the drum. Can you get me out of here? I'm inside the drum. Well, let me see if I can help you. Come on here, fella. Yeah, can you get me out? We better switch you back to our studio. This boy's a little... I'm trying to get you out now, Fred. Yeah. Back to the studio. The greatest name in birdseed brings you another exciting episode of Just Plain Stella Bear. King Kong Birdseed, the only birdseed that makes your parakeet look like an ape, sound like a lion, and gentle as a bear, brings you another exciting coincidence. Starring Stella Bear, gifted stage and screen star Margaret Hartburn in the title role, Kindly Old Lady. As our story opens, we find Papa Bear and Mama Bear. Inside the bear living room, where they're apparently planning to watch a little television, shall we, Judge? Yeah, it's just a good dinner, Ma. Just sit down here and relax and watch TV. Boy, it sure is good just to have Herbert back in reform school. So we yes, it is. Get a little quiet and peace around here. Well, turn on the set, Ma. I want to watch the Huntley Brinkley Report. Time for the news. Oh, no, 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 wait a minute. I wanted to watch my television westerns. I missed them. You can watch your news later on. Oh, come on. No, no I'm going to watch a western. Set on there and see what we get. When we get on. Boy. Oh, that's not the Huntley Brinkley report. Let me switch over here and get another channel. I told channel. you, if you get your hands off that I channel. I want to watch the news. I'm going to watch it, Wester. Wiggins! Oh! Wish you meet you. At least you get 
it even tip her? Oh, that's still not the white show here. I'm sick and tired. Now, you just leave that tip. No, I want to try another now, listen. channel there. I'm not... Come on, boys. Those Indians are right behind us. Let's get moving. You're right. Oh, Ma, that's still not the right show. All right, all up. right. I give up myself. Let me try if this. If you want to watch Huntley and Brinkley, watch Huntley and Brinkley. I'm leaving the room. So oh, there. all right. That's the way you're going to be. I'll just switch the channel over here and watch it. Good night, David. Good night, Chet. How do you like that? I missed the Huntley Brinkley report, and now the doggone television set's popped a tube. Doggone you, Chet. What's the matter with you, anyway? I'll call my service man. <laughs> Looks like he's stuck watching Douglas Edwards tonight. <laughs> is he still on? <laughs> King Kong Birdseed has brought you another exciting episode of Just Plain Still of Air, starring Margaret Hartburn in the title role. Yes, this kind little lady. Based on the book Not Enough, Soon Enough by Claudia Clyde. Adapted for radio by Geraldine Fitzgeraldine. Mr. Announcer, mm. would you like to buy a busted television set cheap? Listen, I'm a radio man, and I know which side my bread's buttered on. This has been a Sherman D. Tank production. You're not welcome. I don't watch no television. Happy birthday, dear Eddie. Happy birthday to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Rather large. Can you move back a little Can bit? Can I move back? Come here, let's get it in here. All right, fine. Now it's in there. And the candle, of course, is already lit. And if you'd like to, just go ahead and blow. Let's you get that set. Right. Oh, yeah. Get one big one. Oh, come oh. on. Try again. Now, come on now. There. Well, congratulations and happy birthday, Ed. And here's your check for this week. Thank you. Yeah, I noticed there's something extra in there, a blue slip. What does this mean? Get out. <laughs> Thank you. After this year, I stopped counting them. As Bill Stern used to say, that's almost a 3-0 mark for tonight. <laughs> Thank you, gang. Stick around, and we'll all uh, listen to the news together or something here. Now... King Kong Birdseed, the greatest name in Birdseed, brings you another exciting episode of Just Plain Stella Bear. The only Birdseed that makes your parakeet look like an ape, sound like a lion, and gentle as a bear. Yes, the heartwarming story of Stella Bear and her fight for love and happiness, starring the gifted stage and screen star, Margaret Hartburn, in the title role of Stella Bear. Clear your throat, sir. <laughs> Kindly old lady, I've been doing it too long. <clears throat> Kindly old lady. That story opens. Mama Bear and Papa Bear have just finished a cup of coffee. Oops. Finished there's sound man. Told you to quit drinking on the job. The sound man got the DTs <laughs> there. As our story opens, we find Mama Bear and Papa Bear in the kitchen discussing something most important. Now, it's very simple, Ma. We've got to remember to set all the clocks ahead an hour when we go to bed Saturday night. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Paul. See, daylight saving time starts at midnight or 2 a.m. Sunday morning. Now, that means that we have an extra hour of daylight in the evening so you can now, stay wait, outside. Wait, wait. Yeah, you mean it starts actually Saturday night, then, doesn't it? Well, technically, it's Sunday morning because it's 2 a.m., but I then that, that actually moves it up to 3 a.m., see? When you actually hit 2 a.m., you lose an hour, and so you don't get the hour back for six months. You well, see. you're a lion hog today. <laughs> I'm not even in the show. i got two pages of mm-hmm, Papa Bear. Well, what's your question? Well, I was just trying to figure out how we lost that hour as soon as we set the clock up. Well, that's because They're you back. they take it away from you for six months. You get it back in uh, October again. Grandma Fickard gave me that clock 20 years ago, and nobody's going to take it away from me. Nobody's going to take the clock away, Ma. They're just going to move it up an hour. Move my clock up an hour. That's right. All you do is move the hour hand up an hour. It's as simple as that. No wonder taxes are so high. They're going to pay some dummy all that money to come around and move all the clocks up an hour. Oh, it gives you an extra hour of daylight, and during the evening you will have light till 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night. All right. Now, what does that mean to me? Well, that means that you can stay outside longer if you want to. 
Well, I don't see that that really helps me any, does it? Let's Herbert play out on the streets longer. Lots of good yes. things there. Maybe the good humor trucks will have to run over him yes, or something. there's always that possibility. Oh, it were true. Now, if you'll just let me go over there and move the hands up on this clock and get it all set and fix the clocks all over the house for Sunday, we'll be all right. Now, wait a minute. I think I've got a solution to the whole problem, Papa Bear. What's that, Ma? I've decided to sell the house. Sell the house? Sell the house. What's that got to do with it? We're going to move to Manassas. What for? They don't have no foolish daylight time down there. They stay like it's been for 200 years. Oh, for goodness sake. We to be in Manassas. <laughs> Looks like Manassas is going to be in the cold, cold ground here for the next couple of months if Mama Bear moves down there. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. King Kong Bird Seed has brought you another exciting episode of Just Plain Silver. If you've ever been in Manassas in January, get it. Last of them, Well, that's bad. Well, it's Friday and it's fun day. Based on the book, Not Enough, Soon Enough, by Claudia Clark. I'm so bored with doing this show. The only thing I do, you know, folks, since... Uh, Here's a little something for you. What's this? It's pink. Ooh. After 22 years... Well, move over, one man's family. We all got to go sometime. Welcome once again to our fabulous interview session here. We are indeed fortunate to have with us in our studio, without a doubt, one of the nation's greatest dancing team. And it's been a real pleasure for us to sit here and chat with them before this brief radio interview. I'm talking about Margin Gouger Champion. These uh, wonderful people have been dancing their way into the hearts of many Americans by way of television, motion pictures, and uh, the regular legitimate theater. Mr. Marge and Mr. Gouger, and uh, Miss Gouger, is it Miss Gouger? No, he's Gouger, and I'm Marge. Hello, Gouger. How do you do? And you are Marge. Yes, that's right. Well, you sit down, dear, make yourself comfortable. Thank you. We work together so well. Why, uh, you've been married now for about 15 years, That's correct, uh, Willard, and I can truthfully say that we work together very well in the various media. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful. It's really very, very wonderful for us to be able to chat with you again. We'd like to demonstrate a few of our more complicated dance steps for the people this afternoon. Gouger is going to uh, do a few of the more compli complicated steps we've done on the Dinah Shore show and, and uh, the Steve Allen show and many of the other shows. Well, I've certainly been a great fan of yours for a long time, and it's going to Thank be you. a pleasure to watch you to work. You what, would you, what would you like to see me do first, Will? Well, just show us some basic steps that you all have developed. You have your own style, even in basic steps, I understand. Yes, we do. Now, Gouger, would you like to go first? All right, dear. Let me see here. Here's a very basic uh, step, Willard, that you might see in any chorus line where you sort of, the hoofers, you know. Wait a minute, Gouger, Gouger. Huh? What? I think you did that wrong, Gouger. You were supposed to, uh, the left foot should come out just a little bit. Oh, okay, honey, if that's what you... I think I'm right. No, you're not. Now, you tried my way. Okay. I uh, still think that's harder to do than the, uh, well, anyway, one of the big dances these days is the uh, the cha-cha-cha. Now, if you give me a little cha-cha beat there, Willard, I'll try to do a cha-cha for you. Oh. Then. Wait, 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 wait. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Uh, What's the matter now? I don't think you did that quite right, Gadget. For goodness sake, Marge, I'm... Just as much a part of this team as you are, and I don't think you should criticize the way I do these dance steps. It did seem a little awkward with that left foot. All right, foot listen, if you one, think you're Marge, so smart, uh, uh, Marge, why don't you do them yourself? All right. Give me that cha-cha beat again, Willard. I'll show him how to do it. He tripped me. He tripped his... I never did such a thing in my life. I After saw you trip 20 years I mean, working together. You keep out of this, Scott. I know, This is I mean, my problem. No, it's my problem. Well, too. I did, now, I don't uh, have to stand around you. put your foot it. right there. I'm going to go to Chief Fred right Astaire or Catherine I mean, Murray or something. I don't want to get involved in a family fight. But, uh, uh you did. Oh, 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 my gosh. Oh, yeah. I was right here. Where were you? We invited you to the party, and nobody ever showed up. I'm disgusted with it. Miserable wreck. Nobody ever showed up to a party around this crazy place. You get all the beer and the bras in there? Forget it, forget it. Seventy, seventy-five. You, you are there. Have an hour, Casal, sir. It was in April of 1775 that Paul Revere made his famous ride through the New England states. One if by land, two if by sea. This was the word that was handed out. And our NBC microphone and Walter Box Kite, our NBC correspondent, was there. We switch you now to Walter Box Kite 
a kite <laughs> somewhere in New England. Or a box kite somewhere in New England where we are awaiting the midnight ride of Paul Revere. The scene has been set for you now. We're standing in front of an old farmhouse. <laughs> Off in the distance, I can hear the horse of Paul Revere. He's now approaching. Oh, come on, horse. Whoa, Larry. Whoa. Paul Revere. I work for the Revere Copper and Brass Works. Would you like to buy a few pots and pans? These are stainless steel, and they don't uh, they don't smear. They don't do anything, and uh, they're waterless cookery, and they're wonderful. We don't need no pots and pans. Now get out of here. Quick. This was the famous scene in April in 1775. You <laughs> Our WRC weather girl, the sweetheart of all Washington, here she is, stepping out of her plate glass booth. She fell again. Help her up, somebody. There she is, Miss Janitor. Good afternoon. Pepper Young, Box 245, Grand Central Station. Father Barber. Box 422, Heathcliff, San Francisco. Wait a minute. What what does this have to do with the weather? What are these names you're reading of? Pepper Young and Father Barber and all that? Well, these are people that their soap operas went off the air last week, and I thought somebody might like to give them a job. Oh, I see. So you're giving their mailing address so that you can be helpful, huh? That's right. Very thoughtful of you, dear, but uh, don't you think you ought to give the weather? I mean, that's what we pay you for around here. Well, that's the question. Yeah, it sure is. The question is how long we're going to keep you, too. Well, why don't you go back and, uh, you know, sharpen up the pencils for Frank Forrester or something, will you? Okay. So long. Miss Janitor may be back tomorrow. But it's, it's doubtful. Attention, please. The next event to Jim. This is WRC sportscaster Jim Simpleton speaking to you from the Ricky Sports Coliseum here in the nation's capital, where the world's champion javelin throw tournament is being held. Arnold Ribjoint, two-time javelin throws world champion, is about to heave the spear javelin, attempting to set a new world's record. From where we're standing, we can look right down the line of throw. Arnold is poised, his muscles tighten, he grips the spear, and here comes the throw. Ooh. Ladies and gentlemen, Arnold Ribjoint has been disqualified since his aim was off and a javelin spear went out of bounds. This is Jim Simpleton returning to our studio. Time once again for the moment for which so many of you have been waiting. Time to check the temperatures in our area. And here's the girl who was voted Miss Fit of 1959, stepping out of her glass booth now. Oh, she fell again. Well, that's par for the course, I guess. Here is Miss Janet. Thank you. California, GPL 432-615. Pennsylvania, LM 465-579. Washington, GK L2 347. Just, just a moment. What are all these numbers you're reading? I don't hear a temperature in the whole bit there. What is it? Well, as I came in this afternoon, I checked the licenses on the cars in the NBC parking lot, and I jotted them down thinking they might be of interest to people that own their cars. It's sort of like hearing your name on the radio. I see. Well, that's very thoughtful of you, but I'm sure all the folks wanted to hear the uh, temperatures. Well, uh, that's what Frank Forrester's here for. Well, I hate to disillusion you, dear, but that's what you're hired for, to read us the temperatures. Now, why didn't you have them today? Well, the newsroom just isn't cooperating this week. I see. Well, you haven't been cooperating with us for months. If you'll check your pay envelope tomorrow, there'll be a little something extra in there for you. Really? Yes. It's pink. Thousands of years, men have been mystified and horrified at the ancient art of head shrinking. Where did it come from? How did it start? Why did men wish to shrink our heads of human men and other men's heads? Oh, pardon me, dear. Today we have with us... <laughs> a little loud in the studio, but we have her here in the studio 
With us today, from high up in the Andes Mountains of South America, from deep within the Mushu Mushu country, the famed South American head shrinker and witch doctor, Dr. Scooby-Doo. Dr. Scooby-Doo, welcome. Good afternoon, friends. It is a great pleasure to be with you today. Your senorita is a little noisy in the background there. I think she had some radishes for lunch. It is very possible, senor. Today, you're an alka seltzer. And today we yeah. discuss the mystic art of head shrinking. You have been shrinking heads for years. It's an old native custom, shrinking heads, yes. Why do men shrink heads, doctor? Sometimes one man feels that another man's head is a trifle too big, as in show business, and we shrink the head, and sometimes when we capture our, our uh, criminals in war, we wear the heads on our belt. And you call that that showbiz? That's head shrinking, I yes. say, yes. Well, I notice you have all sorts of intricate little tools. That is correct, yes. What are these delicate little instruments you have here? All of these vials contain the mystic ingredients for my formula for shrinking head. What is this? Right here, you see, we have a dash of Petty Rosboromo Valley. See? A little sodium acetyl salicylate. What is this over here in this A tube? little except of jasmine branch. I see. And there we have some Scooby-Doo juice. Scooby-Doo juice. Some caterpillar milk. Right there, we pour a dash of that. I see. Then a little hexachlorophene. I see. Essence of Bisteris there. Bisteris, I see. That's right. Mm -hmm. And finally, a pinch of Bridget Bardot. A pinch of Bridget Bardot? Now, wait a minute. What kind of jazz is a pinch of Bridget Bardot? Wishful thinking, my oh, friend. All yes, right. of course. Are you going to shrink a head for it? I will endeavor to shrink a head for you. Okay. My assistant will come in. <laughs> Look at Stand the head still. off. <laughs> we got Schlitz beer before, doesn't it? Stand still, my boy. <laughs> all right, now, what are you going to do with it? I just pour and mix these magic ingredients that I have told you about together there. Stir well. Now then, I shall rub it on his head. Notice the head is beginning to shrink. There it goes. You notice that? Notice how the head has shrunken? Looks just like the end of a gear shift. Yes, you know? <laughs> that is correct. Very good for getting into sports cars. Sits you know. up there like a wart, doesn't it? Now you know that my magic formula works. That's wonderful. You can yeah. sell it to DuPont and That's make a million. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, you, look out, you spilled it, Professor. Oh, oh I have I... Don't get it on me. I'm oh, sorry. I, uh, don't rub it on your head, Why, professor. I've got a heavy day tonight. I might as well rub it on my head. Look what happened to my head. The professor's head is shrunk down this to the size terrible. of a knob in here. I think Help. we'd better get... <laughs> Call a doctor. Smithsonian, we got yes. one for Call you. Call a doctor, would you please? Call a doctor, please. your parakeet look like an ape, sound like a lion, and gentle as the bear brings you the heartwarming story of Stella Bear and her fight for love and happiness, starring the gifted stage and screen star Margaret Hartburn in the title role of Stella Bear, kindly old lady. It is late afternoon in the bear house as our story opens. We find Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Herbert Bear, their young 38-year-old son, who is still in the seventh grade at school. Apparently, Herbert's in a contest of some kind, as Pop Bear oh, says. Well, Herbert, now, uh, let me get this straight. You're going to be in the big contest at school. Yeah, that's right, Pa. I'm going to be in a bubble gum blowing contest. Man's a notion, Herbert. Let's get it out straight again. Now, what kind of contest? The bubble gonna gum blowing contest. You're going to be in the bubble gum blowing contest. Yeah, this is the semifinals coming up tomorrow night, boy. And You've I'm got the mouth for it, Herbert. You think so, do you? Yeah. Well, I bought a couple of wads of bubble gum here, and I thought maybe you could watch it and see how good I'm doing. See? Well, just be careful. We'll just it. pop a couple of these. Why in does here. our son do something like enter the boxcar derbies or something? I mean, Boy, this is good bubble gum. You know, they got a new flavor here or something. I don't know what it is. Chicken mint. Pizza, like I think smell it it is. across the room. Here. Okay. You stand back now. I'm going to blow a big bubble, and I want you to tell me if you think it's big enough to win the contest. Okay? All right, Okay, Herbert. Herbert go ahead, son. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, now, Herbert, don't make a bubble first. Oh, don't worry about a thing. You talk plainer with that bubble gum in your mouth than you do ordinarily. Boy, that's a big bubble you got there, Herbert. Good night. Look at that. Covering the whole room. Herbert, be careful. Step. Don't worry about me, Ma. 
Boy, I got a real good bubble gum going here. It's, uh, Ooh. it busted. It sure did. Boy. Blew the whole bit as well as the bubble Boy, the gum. bubble gum just broke here. All over your hair, Herbert, you're a mess. Well, oh, no, the kids used to tell me I was stuck up, and I never quite understood what they mean, but boy, now I sure do. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> Looks like Herbert's all up in gum in his hair and all over his eyes, and he's just one big old mess. It's <laughs> the most gummed up script I ever saw in my life. Pretty I'll bad, sure, yes. Yeah. Certainly was. King Kong bird seeds. The greatest name in Birdseed has brought you another exciting episode of Just Plain Stella Bear. Why don't you get sick again? Based on the book, Not Enough Soon Enough by Claudia Clyde. Adapted for video by Geraldine Fitzgeraldine. Get a little sick or something like that. I think we're all sick. This has been a Sherman D. Tank production. Yeah, you're welcome. Get the penicillin over there. Boy, I'll give him another shot in the arm there, will you? In Cuba, where I had a big talk like him now. <laughs> Bella Lagosi is my grandfather. Actually, I had a real blast down there. But the point is, when I came back, I was very chagrined to find my partner and co worker, Ed Walker, tired, pooped out, Tucker, just an old tiddling nervous wreck here. So I thought to myself, I'll go over to a travel agency and get Edward a vacation. So yesterday, I went over to a traveling agency. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we'll write them next week. Are you the travel agency? <laughs> yes, I am. And what can I do for you this afternoon? My friend Ed Walker. I'm Walker of Walker and Scott. Ooh, you're on the radio, aren't you? Well, <laughs> matter of speaking, yes. Terrible show. My partner, Ed Walker, is tired and nervous, and he needs a little bit of a rest and vacation. I was wondering if you couldn't suggest something nice for him to do, he and his wife and little baby girl. Ooh, could I? Let's just look in my little catalog here. And now then... What do you have, something nice and restful and peaceful and quiet? Just the thing he would like. Here's a wonderful one-week vacation in Nassau. Wonderful. wonderful. Air-conditioned hotel room, radio, Great. television, wonderful. bar set up there, wonderful. three meals a day. Well, how much? $2,000. No, 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 that's too much. Eddie can't quite go that this time. Oh, I thought you were treating him. No, 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 uh, this is just for him. I'm all right, how about... Ooh, here's a nice one. What's this? Bermuda for Bermuda one Bermuda week. Air-conditioned room, radio, television, bath, private bath, phone, three meals a day. How much? $1,500. Ooh, no, 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 you pay... We want something a little more economical than this, something a little, you know, well, quiet and peaceful and restful. Ooh, very... here's one. What's that? One week in Miami. On the beach, air-conditioned room, hotel, bath, radio, television, three meals a day, car service at your disposal. How much? A thousand dollars. No, 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 no. You missed the whole point. We need something economical, something that'll give him a rest, put his mind at ease. Not a, he doesn't want to buy the state or anything. He's not trying to move in on the government. He just wants something peaceful and quiet. Give us something in the, in the, in the economy line. Well, here's just the thing he'd like. What's it? For one week. What is it? A room at the Y, 25 bucks. Oh, for heaven's sakes, get out of here. That's not what he needs, I tell you. Johnson & Swanson, world's greatest manufacturer of first aid kits, Spring is here. bring you another visit with Mr. Spring Fixit, radio's original do-it-yourself program. Today, as we join Mr. Mr. Fixit, Fix we find name. him in his backyard with his gasoline-powered lawnmower. <laughs> Hello there. Hello there. Hi, Willard Fixit. Scott. How are you, pal? <laughs> Wonderful to see you. The birds are singing today. <laughs> Enough birds. That's it. There yes, go. sir, Willie boy. It's a wonderful springy day in Washington, isn't it? Huh? Oh, it's a beautiful day, Mr. Fixit. Well, this week I thought we'd talk about cutting the grass. That's a big subject and will be during the coming months. Yes, sir. From now until September or so, all the men of the house will be got, getting out there on Saturday afternoon to cut the lawns, you know? Mow the lawn. And uh, I thought that I'd give you a few tips on how to uh, get your uh, gas lawnmower into shape for the spring season. Of course, nobody uses an old hand-pushed lawnmower anymore, do they? And not too much. Now you'll find most of them like to take it easy. they got a, a power mower. So our recording engineer, Bob Shetton, he still uses a hand-driven mower. He yeah, says. he's sort of decadent, isn't he? I've noticed that. <laughs> anyway, uh, this Don't particular mower is a very comfortable one. You see, you can ride on this one. Oh, this is really a cute little yeah. gadget. Yeah, now this one, I, uh, I'm got just... Got an umbrella over the top to shade you from the sun. Keep you getting sunburned and everything. Wonderful. I've just about completed all the uh, finishing uh, touches on here. Uh, a little gas in there. Uh-huh. Now then, Willie... First, you got to make sure that the blades are sharpened. We've oh, sharpened up the blades. Me. That's very sharp. Blades Don't cut yourself sharp, there. Yes. And, of course, you have to have the motor well lubricated and uh, ready for use. Well oiled, Mr. Fixer? Well, uh, well uh, yes, I am, but I'll be all right by the time the show is over. Oh, well, now, <clears throat> now then, I'll just get up on the lawnmower here, and you pull this little string, you see, Willard, and... Yeah. Uh, Hey, listen to that little old son of a gun drive. Yeah, this thing is pretty good more. I'll tell you, I built it myself, of course. And, uh, whee, it's going pretty fast, Willie. Hey, you're doing a great job.
great job, Mr. Look at the way he's cutting that grass. He's working to dig down and just fight that grass. It's a little wet is squirting gas out of the back there, Willard. Don't get yourself in the way. All right, it's all right. I'm running along with the pledge here to keep up with the more. It's really, really a great little gas. Yeah, it's moving along. Wait a minute. You're going a little too yeah, fast I, for me. I can't. Sure getting out of control. Well, I, I can't run much more. By the way, I'm going to have to cut out right here. Okay, okay Willard. Willard. I'm far away from the house, Willard. I can't seem to control the lawnmower, Willard. Hey, Willard, you're going to move. You're getting to the garage. Watch the garage. We've been visiting with radio's original do-it-yourselfer, Mr. Fix-It, brought to you by Johnson & Swanson. We're very fortunate to have with us in the club, for you janitor listeners, the famous French actor Philippe Le Creep, who has starred in many motion pictures. Halfway to there, the sun was green, my grandmother's garter, and many other famous pictures which you've seen at the regular art cinemas across the country. But Monsieur Le Creep does not speak English, is that right? That is correct. I am his interpreter. Ah, uh, well, could we ask Mr. Lecreep some questions? Before you do, Mr. Philippe wants me to tell you that he is most happy to be with you on <laughs> He said yes. He agrees with me. Yes what? Just yes. Oh, all right. Go ahead, ask the first question. I We'd like to ask Mr. Lecreep how long he's been in motion pictures. Monsieur Lecreep? Alors, la façon de question est de savoir la zone de ces motion pictures. Eh, c'est le son de qui est en tête, soit c'est ton que c'est que que sont deux que sont deux grands soirs. C'est ton que sont deux ou des endroits que mes frères de Bernard et Pierre ont contre. Qu'est-ce que tu penses de ces endroits qui sont ces deux grands que c'est ce monde de toi? He forgot. Oh, he did, eh? Yes. Oh, well, uh, let's ask him uh, where he got his first big break in motion pictures in France, or was it uh, working the Cirque and the Riviera, or just how did he get his first big break? Monsieur Le Creep, I was going to say that the motion picture de motion picture is in Paris, or is going to say that New York. Squeak! He said that there was a long story. He was discovered by a French artist in Paris one day, given a screen test. And since that time, he's been a big motion picture star. I uh, think this interview has all the essence of a great big phony fake. Monsieur, you hurt me deeply when you say things like that. Well, I don't mean to apply anything. Monsieur le creep, à la zombo que ça va de son dieu. Quelle est son de mise en Qu'est-ce que c'est le son de mise en dieu? Mais son de ton toi, quel est son de ton toi? Monsieur le creep says, drop dead. Back to our studio. And now. King Kong Birdseed, the greatest name in birdseed. The only birdseed that makes your parakeet look like an ape, sound like a lion, and just heal his bear. Brings you another exciting episode of the heartwarming story of Stella Bear and her fight for love and happiness. Starring the gifted stage and screen star, Margaret Hartburn, in the title role of Stella Bear, kindly old lady. As our story opens, we find Mama Bear and Papa Bear out of the town for an evening, visiting with the Guggenheims up the street for a charming dinner. Dinner has just been finished. Fishes are being put away. And the story opens. Papa Bear looks at Mama Bear and says, Boy, oh, they're nice folks, aren't they, Ma? The Guggenheims. Hello, Good I... food there. Oh. Sure enjoyed that shrimp wiggle escapoodle. I'll tell you that, Ma. Yeah, I didn't mind the shrimp escapoodle, but the wiggle there sort of got on. Ben, we're glad you enjoyed the meal. You certainly are, Mr. and Mrs. Bear. Oh, Mr. Guggenheim, it certainly is nice to have you have us over. Nice to have good friends and you get together once in a while, yeah? Isn't that the nice Yeah, thing? that sure is. Wish they'd take that swastika off the wall. they <laughs> kind of diehards. Say, who did you leave uh, babysitting with Herbert tonight, Ma, or did you? No, I thought Herbert's big enough. He's 38. I didn't take care of him. Well, I, you know, he's not too dependable, Ma. He can amuse himself. Yeah. He'll count his toes. He gets a different answer every time. He seems to enjoy that. I see. Well, maybe you ought to call him just to check on him. Herbert! Go right ahead. No, he's not here. you got to call him on the phone. <laughs> Go right ahead and use the phone there, Mrs. Bear, if you want to. Thank you very much. Yeah, just give him a yeah. call, Ma, and see how he's... Yeah, just checking. I'm sure he's all right. But, Our number's uh, Emerson 2-4-5. we got a good number. It sounds like NBC there. Well. Uh, I'm sure Herbert's all right. I just like to check on these things, you know, Ma. It's better to be safe than sorry. Sure hope Herbert's all right. Mm-hmm. 
I am. I Herbert is such a dependable lad. The answer yet, Ma? Not yet. Do do do. It's your guy who start talking. Hello, Herbert. This is your mother, Mama Bear. Oh, hello, Mama Bear. How are you? Do 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 do. Fine, darling. How are you? Oh, just fine. We're having a wonderful time over here. It's kind of cool outside. So you know what I did? I built a great big roaring fire right here in the living room. Boy, it's nice and cozy. But Herbert. What, Ma? We ain't got no fireplace. No wonder I couldn't find the chimney. <laughs> do 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 do. Papa Bear. What, Ma? Herbert built a fire in the house. But we don't have a fireplace, Ma. He knows now. <laughs> Told you you better check on him. <laughs> yeah, little Herbert looks like he's a pyromaniac. something there. Is it? King Kong Birdseed has just brought you another exciting episode of Just Plain Stella Bear. Starring Margaret Hartbird in the title role of Stella Bear, Kindly Old Lady. Based on the book Not Enough, Soon Enough by Claudia Clyde. Adapted for radio by Geraldine Fitzgeraldine. This has been a Sherman D. Tank production. You're welcome. Friends, this is Carl Cruller broadcasting from Georgetown here. We're speaking to you from the non-existent donut shop in Georgetown where a lot of the beatniks hang out here. This is where they come for quiet, uninhibited conversation. Little coffee and pastries and poems and good talk and fellowship. And seated across the table from me this afternoon is one of the people who frequent this place. What is your name, Fran? Shh, please, sir, quiet. Huh? Quiet, quiet, please. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, I'm listening. You're listening to what, Fran? I'm listening to the wind. Don't you hear it? Listen, man, it's beautiful. I hear a few noises Shh. from the air conditioner Shh. there. That's about all. Shh, listen. That's, that's wind. The wind is talking. And you know what it's saying? No, what's it saying? Of course you wouldn't understand what the wind is saying. All you do is listen to people talk. Yes, well, You I... read my newest book? No, I haven't. Uh, well, by the way, what's your name, friend? My name is Nick Beat. Nick, good to have you with us, boy. You, you didn't read my new book. No, what is the book, Nick? What if it happened to people? What is the name of my new book? I see. I understand, Nick, that you're quite a poet. I write a little poem. I noticed you. Would you please be quiet? Those two over there are trying to communicate, and you're disturbing them. They're not, the not saying a word. Such that you don't bet you missed the whole bit. You apparently don't understand. Uh, what we are here for. We are here for what we are here for. I'm here to interview you, Nick. That's what I'm here for. Now, I see on your napkin here you've written a few poems. Would you care to read them to the I would, uh, folks not out there? Yes, you no. Know, well, let me hear one of your poem. poems, Nick, boy. A kangaroo's pouch and my grandmother. Yes, go on. That's it. That's the poem? That's the poem. Doesn't even rhyme. Well, it's abstract. It uh, certainly is. It don't have to rhyme. It's uh, just poem. And this is a big-selling book these days, huh? Well, a book is no there. The poem is the book. That is the... the book, yes. I see. Would you like another one? Yes, I would. Stripes. And what? That's it. Just stripes. Well, it's the word. It's supposed to conjure what it means in the mind. Yes, mind. I see. What you do. Notice you're drinking coffee there, Nick. Can I have a cup of that uh, Java there with you, please? You well, certainly may. The interview shouldn't be a total loss. The interview. Yeah, thank you, Nick. That's very. Uh... Is that delicious? There's nothing in here, Nick. That's it. Instant nothing. It's good coffee. Oh, this is ridiculous. One final question, Nick. I understand you've written your. Wait, 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 wait. The room is moving. You all right? Don't you feel it? The room, the room is moving no, around. No, I, I don't notice it. No. The room is moving around, and it's moving up and down as it moves around. It is? Yes. I see. Kiss me. I think somebody's got your swivel chair hooked up here. Uh, Nick, I understand you've written a poem or a book of your life. Here's the book here. I'd just like to read the preface. It's sort of an audio biography. Uh-huh. Let me... Because I'm just all sound. It's an audio biography. see what, uh... Nothing in here, Nick. Well, I... They're all blank pages, nothing written on them. That's the story of my life. It's, uh... Big nothing? No, it's uh, the way the pulp is arranged. Can't you see the pulp? The way the pulp is arranged? Well, you see, the paper is made of pulp paper. Yes. And the way the pulp is arranged is the way that my life is arranged. What, is, what does that mean? That means I'm a tree. You're a tree? That's right. Well, I've never heard such ridiculous carrying on in my life. Hey, You're... What? What's that? The dog. Get that dog away from me. Why? I'm a tree. Get that dog oh, away. This is ridiculous. Get that dog, 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 dog. This has been a big nothing interview. Now back to our studio.
Yes, while Bill Hickok does make belts. No, Popsicle is not the name of a soap opera character. Yes, Buster Crab is the name of a special seafood dinner at O'Donnell's Restaurant. No, Bogan David is not the name of an NBC newscaster. It's time once more for radio's time-honored program, The Answer Man. Now in its 83rd year. Each week at this time, The Answer Man answers the questions you, the radio listener, send to him. And now, here is The Answer Man. Well, good afternoon, folks, and hello there, Willard Scott. Hello, Mr. Answer Man. Hi, it's good to be with you folks again today, and I see we have lots of letters in the old mailbag. Like always, sir. <laughs> well, let's read the first one, shall we? <laughs> Our first question comes from a school teacher from Southeast, uh, right? Yes. Why were the Romans interested in building such an extensive road system? And well, you see, the Romans were very enthusiastic sports car drivers, and they used to have drag races on the weekends. And Ben Hur, I think, was president of the group, and they had chariots with wire wheels. Sort of a uh, Corvette club of the Stone Age, you know how it was. Second question from an office worker from downtown who writes, what is the largest member of the Bird family that flies? I guess that would be Harry Bird. He flies from Norfolk to Richmond and back around all over the state of Virginia. He really gets all over the place. Our third question, a racehorse fan says he would like to know what a good tip would be for tomorrow's fourth at Laurel. Ah, oh, for goodness sake, how did anybody have the nerve to write a question like that? Now, you know that we don't give out information of that to uh, sort on this program. It's not good radio ethics or practice to give out information of that type when it has to do with a uh, parimutuel system. Tony's son looks pretty good in the fourth. A young rocket enthusiast from Gordon Junior High School would like to know the reason for internal combustion in the second stage of an average normal workaday rocket. Well, you've got to figure that the average normal workaday rocket has the three stages. And the second stage, of course, where you have the internal combustion, is created by a result of the first stage uh, interaction on the third radio stage. Time the show, second the stage man. is uh, near the back stage. For which you'd like As a matter of fact, just uh, the letter on the card to the answer man, WRC Radio, Red Square, Hartford, to Virginia, along with six hundred thirty. $5 to cover the cost of handling and mailing. And be with us again next week when once again we'll present The Answer Man. It's time once more for Great Moments in History. The facts and true story behind momentous events that have helped to shape the present day world. Today's Great Moment in History, the cheapskate submarine surfaces at the North Pole. Ladies and gentlemen, the cheapskate, one of the first atomic-powered submarine had just left Groton, Rotten, Connecticut. As the submarine pulled away, the hatches were battened down. <coughs> Inside, below deck of the submarine, for four days, it sailed underneath the surface of the water towards the center point of its destination, the North Pole. What was its mission? What was it to accomplish? The captain, 30 seconds before arriving at the North Pole, explains to his men. Now, hear this. Now hear this. You men have been handpicked for this special mission. I cannot impress upon you the importance of this mission and what a morale builder this will be for the United States Navy. In just 15 seconds, we will be immediately under the ice cap of the North Pole. After we've passed under the ice cap, we will surface. Gee, I uh, wonder what we're doing here. What's the reason for surfacing at the North Pole? We need the ice for cocktails at the officers' club. And that's today's great moment in history, the true story and facts behind the cheapskate voyage underneath the ice cap at the North Pole. <laughs> and now... Birdseed, the only bird seed that makes your parakeet smell like an ape, look like a lion, and gentle as a bear, brings you the exciting behind the scenes stuff. You've got the wrong microphone. I like it with a little depth. Would you please? As an echo. I'll file a grievance with management if you don't open the right microphone. Okay, sorry. I've been ahead. doing soap operas for 45 Why? years ahead. on this network, and I've never worked with such a crummy and sorry now he's all right. The gifted sage and screen star, Margaret Park Bird. You are the organ. Can we do anything to get organization? All right, okay. Forget it. I don't even know. That story, I forgot how the story opens. They, they shake me up so bad. I wanted to be a garbage collector. My daddy wanted me to be ready now. I just wanted to do this. Oh, you're <laughs> I wish I was back in CBS with Frank and Ann Hubbard. <laughs> the story opens, they're uh, here, right here on this page. Mama Bear is living. The story opens, Mama Bear and Papa Bear in the living room, living, I guess, I don't know. 
kill that argument. Ma. Percy, moon, light, and noses bring wonderful memories of moon, light, and roses. What are you doing, Ma? Oh, I'm trying to compose a song. Oh, for the sake. The moon is yellow, and that's why I love you. You are so beautiful in your dress of gingham blue. Oh, I'll man. see you again in my dreams. Oh, you got to fix dinner, Ma. On the new WEAM screams. I love you because Ma. you're blue. Moonlight and noses. Time again, I wait for you each day. I see the whole day. Whole day. Ma. Time again, I wait for you. I'm hungry, Ma. Time again, the whole day through, I wait Time again, the whole day through, I... I need a word, Paul. A word? Yeah, time again, the whole... Sick. Sick don't rhyme with through. Don't have to rhyme. I'm sick and tired of sitting here listening to you compose these moony, spoony songs, for goodness sake. You're not going to be no Victor Hubert or Irving Berlitz or none of those fellas. Why don't you just go out and fix dinner, Ma? I'm hungry. Well, you're no Robert Hall, either. Don't give me the beer. <laughs> Intimate glimpses of the private life of Mama Bear and Papa Bear. Well, the mic level's nice and loud now, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thank you. King Kong Bird Seed has brought you another exciting edition of Just Plain Stella Bear, starring Margaret Hartburn in the title role, based on the book Not Enough Soon Enough by Claudia Clyde. Ooh, sounds just like Pepper Young's family now. Adapted for radio by Geraldine Fitzgeraldine. This has been a Sherman D. Tank production. Welcome. High host lover, the stock buster rides again. Nowhere in the pages of history can you find a greater champion of justice, a more fearless, hard riding, straight shooting, bear drinking, deep saving son of a sod. It's the stock buster. A true gentleman of the old school. Men feared him, little children respected him, women loved him. A true gentleman. Buster and Chester, back, back, way back inside the hot dog saloon outside of Rockville. Sod Buster looks at Chester, gets up in his chair, speaks. Well, Chester, it's about time for me to go on the stage. Lousy, Mr. Dealer. I sure didn't think you was going to have to go on the stage today. Yep, Chester. Sure did come as a surprise, didn't it? Well, sometimes things happen, Chester, that kind of take us off guard. But why'd they pick you to go on the stage, Mr. Dealer? I don't know, Chester. I guess they figured I'm the man that was right for the job. Oh, yeah. Well, it's almost time for you to get up on the stage, I guess, huh? Yeah, I'm getting a little nervous, Chester. That's too bad. Well, I, I guess I'll see you later on. You will write me, won't you, Mr. Oh, yes, Chester. Okay, I sure. That's the longest we've been separated in many years. Yeah, well, you take care of things here. I don't know if I like the whole idea or not. Well, my watch says it's time for me to go on the stage, Chester, so I'll see you later, boy. Good luck on the stage, Thanks, Mr. Thanks, Chester. Dealer. Good luck, Mr. Dealer. That U.S. Marshal do that fucking wing. <laughs> oh, 
Lucy, I never knew Mr. Dillard could dance that good. He sure is a hit on the stage. <laughs> Buster is written by Larry Lorenz, produced by Bernie Harrison, directed by Dave Brickway. The entire production is supervised for NBC Radio by Bernie Will Neck. The choreography number done by Matt Marshall Matt Dillard was staged by the Smithsonian Institution. Everybody, this is Al Melonhead speaking to you from Marlboro Race Cars here near Washington, D.C. with my assistant, Silbert. We're out here to cover the do, 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 broadcast do, 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 of the preparations for the do, 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 President's do, 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 Cup races this Sunday. This is the fifth annual running. All the sports car enthusiasts around the area are here in preparation for this big race. Now, today, they are just sort of uh, running the cars through for timing and to get acquainted with the track, you know, sport fans. Now then, in just a minute, we'll see a few of these cars and their test runs. Silbert is my assistant. He's standing by spotting the races for me. And I'm sure all you sports enthusiasts will be loving this. Uh, right now, I see that a couple of the drivers are in their cars now, ready to rev up their motors. Let's start them off here. Here's one of them starting off. So they're getting that motor all revved up there, sport fans, you can tell. There he is. Now he's got to take a small lap around the track here. Here he goes. They say it's okay. And off he goes. Now there's another Corvette right behind him, and uh, he's going to rev up his motors right now, take a little test run across the track here. This is a pretty busy day for me out here, sport fans. Here comes that Corvette around the track now. And he took a little rubber off the tires there. I've been out here all day, I'm a little hungry and dry. Filbert, would you run across the track to the hot dog stand and get me a large Coke and a cheeseburger, friend? Do, 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 do I sit the wheel, the large Coca-Cola and the cheeseburger? Thank you, Filbert. Yes, sir. Better watch out, they're getting kind of sticky on that. Look to the right, look to the left, and here I go again. Whee! Oh, that was a shaver, won't it, boy? You want a tea, burger, and a coke, That's right, right. be careful, old okay. okay. Here I go. Whee! Boy, this is going to be a tough job. I can't, well, I'm going to make it this time or what? Let me get out here now. I look to the right, I look to the left. There's nothing coming. Here I go. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Al Melonhead back in the booth. A very strange thing just happened here. My assistant Filbert couldn't quite get across the track before that Corvette caught up with him. So he's raising the Corvette. He's way out ahead of him now. He's going to take the checkered flag all by himself, and he's just broken the all-time lap record at Marlboro. This is not the important thing, Mr. Melonhead. Look, I'll give you still a drop of your Coca-Cola. This is the CBS Radio Network. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Willard Scott, your reference for the WRC, sitting in the Purple Tree Room down here in Washington, D.C., in And today we have a real celebrity in Washington, the star of the famous NBC television show, Bat Masterson, who wears a derby and carries a cane, Mr. Gene Berry Berry. is in the studio with us. Gene Berry, Berry, good afternoon. Welcome, welcome. welcome. Nice to have you aboard, sir. Nice to be with you here this afternoon. Hi, James. Oh, shut up. <laughs> With a cane, Gene. You interrupt me when I was talking. I don't like that. Well, it's a carryover from the show. I have to hit so many people with a cane. It's that's sort of my trademark. You want to drink with the Berry Berry? Yes, not so loud. <laughs> people wouldn't interrupt me when I'm being interviewed. Hit the waiter right next to the table. Well, he bothered me. Gene, you've been in television for a long time, haven't you? That's right. I've been in television for a long time, and just recently I came this good role as Fat Masterson. Yes, me, but I it's think that's my drink over there. I think you're out of here. Well, you knocked a drink right out of his hand with a cane. Now he shouldn't have interrupted me. Yeah. Anyway, I uh, understand that Fat Masterson used to work with Wyatt Earp. I uh, was on Wyatt Earp's show for a while. And you mommy, isn't that Jack Masterson over there? Get out of my way, kid. You hit the kid with the cane. Well, I'm oh, going Kind of a surprise. I wish they wouldn't bother me. I hate these autograph seekers. People always trying to butt in when you're trying to do your eat your meals or talk to somebody or something. I don't want to no privacy. I don't want to say anything, Bat. Well, good. Let's Gene, keep it that way. I think it's a little, uh, you know, a big man like you go around hitting people that stick. I mean, Look, who asked you? Kind of you, a, you I'll hit you if you want it. Why don't you have to do it? Why don't you have to do it? 
station with Johnson and Swanson, world's greatest manufacturer of first aid kits, brings you another visit with Mr. Fixit, radio's original do it yourself program. Today, as we join Mr. Fixit, we're outdoors in his backyard, and apparently he's working on some kind of a barbecue yeah. fit. Oh, boy, there, Mr. Fixit. Hi, uh, hey there. Hello there. Well, I'd. Oh, Mr. Fix-It, Mr. Fix I'm working you? on a barbecue pit, some sort of, yes. You fixed that opening there, Mr. Fix-It. What, did I do something wrong? Oh, I liked it, but uh, how are you? Fine. Well, Archie, it's a nice day, isn't it, huh? Yes, the birds are singing. That's enough. Oh, it's beautiful, Mr. Fix-It. Lovely This is day. the time of year when people get the urge to have their meals cooked out of doors, you know? Grilled pork chops, grilled steaks, hamburgers even taste better, hot dogs, I'll anything at all. I'll bet you I can second-guess what you're going to do. What are we going to do? I'll bet you're going to tell the folks how they can build themselves a beautiful outdoor barbecue pit. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, I'd <you> guess. <laughs> I thought it was a script when you oh, well, sure. Now... We're going to build an outdoor barbecue pit, only this is a little different one. This is a, a very lightweight uh, barbecue pit. It's not one of these wrought iron things. This is made out of bricks. Now, you see, I bought these bricks cheap over at the uh, junkyard here. This guy had them. They look awful light to be bricks, but the guy told me they were bricks, so, you know, I take his word for it. They look awfully light to be bricks, but I guess you took their word for yeah, it. Yeah, I sure did. And uh, now, the thing is, I have uh, perfected a new thing here, Willard. This is... Uh, uh, chemical treatment to make sure that the bricks are uh, uh, sticking together very nicely. It's Mr. Fix-It's own cement, instant cement. Wonderful, wonderful. comes in a tube here, or you can buy it in the spray can, you know. Well, you finish this fireplace over here. It's beautiful. Just a couple more bricks to add. Yeah, to I just saved a few to show you here. Now, look, I, I take I take the, uh, the stuff, and I rub it all over my hands. Yeah. Now, I rub this on the bricks here. Make sure they're coated. Now, I take the brick and slap it on there. See there? Mmm, uh, that's six. You see what I mean? Yeah. Now, have you got a match? Yeah, I, I think I got a few. Let me put some charcoal yeah, in the uh, barbecue pit here now. I think it'd be right. nice if we, uh, well, I just happen to have a half a pound of hamburger. So you and I will have a little snack, okay? Oh, that's now, let me wonderful, just, Mr. Uh, Fix-It. Have a catch it. There we go. It's beginning to burn already. Yeah, see, this is uh, very good. The uh, coals are beginning to catch here. And uh, we don't want anybody to catch colds, but <laughs> you know what I mean. And, uh, <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. Just a minute, no time at all. We'll have a fire going, and we can grill our hamburgers here. Going good there, but uh, look, the flames are leaping up against the side of the barbecue pit there, Mr. Fixit. I don't understand that. Barbecue okay. pit looks to be... The flames are really going crazy. Yeah, I noticed that. Let me just check the uh, bricks on this barbecue pit and make sure they're uh, all right. Mr. Fixit, the whole barbecue pit is ablaze. I'm going to go inside and call the fire department. Yeah, well, something is wrong here. The guy told me that the, they were bricks, but by God, you know, I think they were wood painted to look like bricks. Or wood bricks. That was Fire cheap. department. Hey, that fire was Fire department. We've been visiting with Mr. Fixit, radio's original do-it-yourselfer. Mr. Fixit is brought to you by Johnson & Swanson, the world's foremost manufacturer of first aid kits. Be listening again next week when you'll hear Mr. Fixit say... Ouch! You're very happy about this one. The Washington Plumbers Association just voted us two of the biggest drips in radio. <laughs> <laughs> this is NBC in Washington. Not again. Marlboro, don't forget Marlboro. Sunday. And, uh, of course, you know, Frank Foster comes up in just a few seconds. But first of all, we want to call in our weather prognosticator, the Washington Weather Tower. What does that mean? Wilbur Weathervane, are you there, Wilbur? Weathervane here, speaking from the Washington Weather Tower. And I want you to know that certain weathermen, I'm not mentioning names, but trying to have you believe that the Dalai Lama is still in India due to a rainstorm created by another said certain weatherman that never created such certain rain. I think you're talking around in circles, Wilbur. Do you have any predictions for the weekend? I sure know it's going to be swinging. we got a party lined up down at Bethany Beach. I meant the, the weather itself. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I don't give it rain or snow. I want to get out of town as quick as possible. Uh-huh. Do you want to find out what the weather's going to be? Well, before we go on with this miserable program, I wish a certain weatherman would please get a certain group of weather maps out of another certain weatherman's office. It's highly annoying to have these weather maps lying around, just accumulating dust. A sloppy weatherman is not my idea of an authority, and I'm sick and tired of it. Wilbur, I got news for you. They gave that office to Frank Forrester. Who's she? Well, that's Frank Forrester, and here he is. Down at Northwest from the Cotton Boulevard, come the thundering folks who do great for platinum. From the cloud of dust and the hearty high hole slobber, the sod buster rides again.
Nowhere in the pages of history can you find a greater champion of justice, a more fearless, hard-riding, straight-shooting, beer-drinking, peace-aiding son of Assad. It's the Assad Buster, a true gentleman of the old school. Men feared him, little children respected him, women loved him. about the bad wild lands of the old west, protecting law and order, keeping the visual, watching the girls, and the what is the... Tacoma Park, up in the College Park area, Rome the Sod Buster, the man that was the U.S. Marshal, and the U.S. Marshal that was a man, along with his sidekick, Chester. <coughs> Why'd you kick me in the side, Mr. Dillon? You're my sidekick, Chester. It was early evening. Sod Buster, Matt Dillard, and Chester Drawers were standing outside in the shade. Nice cool evening out here in the Chester. Yes, sir. Sure is, Mr. Dillard. What you doing? Watching old man Sloan chop down that big old pine tree there. Oh, he sure is a working powerful hard, ain't he, he Mr. Sure Dillard? is, Chester. Mr. Dillard? Hmm? Did you see that wild, bearded looking varmint with the big black hat on and the long six shooter who was looking asking for you? No, I didn't, Chester. He's been asking all over town for you, Mr. Dillard. Really? Did you see him in the saloon? Oh, he's a fierce-looking critter. I ain't never seen the likes of him in a long time, Mr. Dillard. Well, maybe I better walk on over there. Where is he? At the short branch, Chester? He's over there at the saloon having himself one or two. Well, uh, come on. Let's go, Chester. I wonder what he wants. He look mean, Chester? Oh, he's meaner than ten wildcats, Mr. Dillard. Yeah. I ain't never seen a more vicious-looking critter. Let's go on inside. All right. Kitty ain't here tonight either, is she, Mr. No, Dillard? I, we wrote her out of the script the last few weeks, Chester. We're doing a guest shout on Maverick, I guess. Yeah. Is that him over there? That's him, Mr. Dillard. I'm going to stand back and yeah, watch Yeah, you wait here, Chester. I'll be right back. Hey, you. Yeah. You looking for me? You, Matt Dillard. Right. Reckon I am. I'm the marshal around these parts. You're the marshal, Matt Dillard. That's right, sir. You're the one I've been looking for. All right. What's on your mind? Reckon I better give it to you straight. All right. I represent the Encyclopedia Britannica. Would you like to buy a set of 12 volumes for only $15.40? We'll throw in the World Book, plus an issue of Life magazine and Playboy for two weeks. I'll take it. Your soul signed a paper. It's been a pleasure doing business with you, Mr. Marshall. All right. So long, sucker. Get out of my town. Well, Mr. Dillard, wasn't too excitement after all. Silliest thing I ever heard of, Chester. Man well, coming around here acting mean and ornery like that. Oh. Well, old man Sloan got his tree down anyway, Chester. Mr. Dillard, would you get that tree off me? I didn't see it coming. Just heard another exciting adventure of the Sod Buster, starring Matt Dillard and Chester Drawers. Pipe Smoke, brought to you today by Hoo-Ha Bubblegum, the greatest name in bubblegum. A bubble in every trouble makes it double fun to pop a bubble. The Sod Buster is written for radio by Larry Lorenz, produced by Bernie Harrison, directed by Dave Reckway. The entire production is supervised for NBC by Bernie Swinnick. Hey, buddy. You yes. want to buy an encyclopedia cheap? Get out of here. I'm the staff man. I just make breaks around here.
WRC Radio presents the WRC Gardening Club. Uh, uh. It's springtime in the nation's capital, and welcome once again as F.W. Bolgiani, the flower grower who grows here and there, presents our good friend Gordon Greenthumb and tips on... Gordon? Well, good afternoon, friends, and hello there, Willard Scott. It's a great pleasure to be with you again, fellow gardeners. Well, Gordon, with that delightful 70 degree temperature on uh, Saturday, I'm sure you're out there green-thumbing it up. Oh, we began to get our gardens into uh, full swing again, uh, tilling the soil and planting our little seeds out there and having just a wonderful time. Spring has come, the grass is whiz, I wonder where my flowers is. <laughs> little poem, I yes. wrote. Well, I'm sure you're awfully glad to have as your sponsor for this new series on WRC, the F.W. Bulgy Annie Company, right? Wonderful people, and they make wonderful garden seeds, and I've met uh, Annie, and she is pretty bulgy, believe me. Slenderella will no take care of that before the season's over. Well, now, how about some personal problems concerning the soil in the District of Columbia? Have you found the soil to be any particular problem, and, and how to correct it? Well, one thing I have noticed, that most soil is dirty. Yeah. Now, this is a Perfect, problem yeah. if you don't like to mess your hands up when you're out there working. You better have some very effective detergent or soap inside so that when you finish gardening, you can give your hands a good scrubbing because, believe me, they will need it. Well, what about the two you're pruning? We had an interesting question concerning Yes, that. well, it is important that you prune your petunias. <laughs> you got a little bit on me, sir. Would you mind using the I, I'm microphone to say it, is, it is important that you prune your petunias promptly. Yes. Because uh, we must not be uh, too impromptu in pruning our petunias. This could be uh, tragic. It's better to be an impatient petunia pruner than an impromptu petunia pruner. Because there is a penalty for uh, impromptness in petuning prunias, or yeah. pruning petunias. I see. And as this means that you must prune your petunias promptly and patiently. Yes. And uh, make sure that your petunias well, are pruned. Certainly. Prudently. Well... Uh, one other question we'd like to ask you about particular preferences in, in flowers, your own particular preference. I, I knew I'd get it out of a minute. Your own particular preference in flowers. Almost as bad as petunia pruning yes, there, isn't well, it? Well, got me confused. Well, I plant a few things that you can tell in my garden here. For instance, I have some five scythia. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Five scythia? That's a little bigger than four scythia. A little inflation has moved in Big here. Big centers. Yes. I see. And uh, over there, I have some rhododendrons. Rhododendron? Yeah, we grow it with vitalis. It's wonderful. Oh, it gets rid of the... Oh, it certainly does. It makes wonderful flowers. Flower. Well, this has been very interesting. Uh, and, of course, for those of you who are listening right now, I'm sure you'd like to know uh, Mr. Gordon Green's own preference. Do you prefer, oh, let's say, uh, flower boxes, or uh, do you prefer uh, little gardens in the back, or potted... Uh, potted? Yeah. Well, I am, but I'll still rub before I go home. Yeah. Big weekend. Be sure to prune your prunias. Er, prune your F.W. Bolgiani has just brought you the petunias. WRC That's Gardening Club with Gordon Greenthumb. The greatest name in bird seed, the only bird seed that makes your parakeet look like an ape, sound like a lion, and gentle as a bear, being another exciting story of just plain Stella Bear. The heartwarming story of Stella Bear and her fight for love and happiness. Starting to get to stage in screen star, Margaret Hartburn in the title role of Stella Bear. Mm -hmm. Yes, as our opens, we find Mama Bear and Papa Bear sitting in the living room after having finished a delectable meal, a souffle of a sort with chicken, some kind of strange Chinese almond nuts, and a little bit of fishy do. And as the story opens, the telephone rings. Papa Bear looks at Mama Bear. Oh, I think the telephone's going to ring. Oh, Pa, you sure are psycho. Yeah, psychic, <laughs> Mom. That's right, that's what I said. I should ring again one more time. It's going to be a big show. Oh, my God, I'll answer Andrew, it. Right. We are too full to Tell move. Tell the sound man. It sounds silly to let it ring the third time. Let it ring a third time. Hello, Mama Bear's residence. No, this is not Dallas, Texas. I'm sorry. You got the wrong number. 
what they think of a challenge, Texas. Good news. Good news. Takes a lie, Mom. Comrade Chilton here. Hello, Mama Bear. No, this is not spooky in Washington. No, I'm sorry. You got the wrong number. People really uh, yeah. got our number tonight, don't they, Mom? Well, can you beat that? For heaven's sake. Hello, Mama Bear. No, this is not Walla Walla. No, it... No, thank you. Watch your language, Walla Walla. That doesn't... Is that the name of the Where's town? that? Where's that? I don't know. No, it sounds like they stutter out there or something, doesn't it? I, I don't know. The phone is even jumping off the wall now, Ma. Okay. Hello, Mama Bear's residence. No, this is not Peoria, Illinois. I'm getting mad about this. wonder what's causing all this. Hello, Mama Bear's resident. No, this is not Montreal, Canada. That's the last one. You've been reading the... Give that sound man I'll bet here. I know what's wrong here. What is it? Somebody's styling this new DDD, and they keep getting our number by mistake. Either that or Artie Shaw's calling all of his wives. Rip the phone out of the wall. Let's get rid of it there. <laughs> he looks like the telephone company's experimenting with DDD. And Papa Bear is getting all riled up. Mama Bear is all put out of it. This is one of those little King Kong Bear feed. It's brought to you another exciting episode of Just Plain Stella Bear. Jack Bogger Hartburn in the title role, Kindly Old Lady. Based on the book Not Enough, Soon Enough by Claudia Clyde. Adapted for radio by Geraldine Fitzgeraldine. And this has been a Sherman D. Tank production. You're welcome. Thank you. Ridge Mountains of Virginia, on the trail of the lonesome pie. And now, Oi Oi, Ukuleles presents Arthur Codfish Time. Oi Oi, the greatest name in ukulele. And now, here he is, Arthur Codfish. The old string, here he is. Tell me, how are you folks? Boy, it's nice to see you, wasn't it? Wasn't it a beautiful day on Saturday? Son of a gun. It was, was all a pretty beautiful day. Who's sponsoring this quarter hour meatball? Ooey, ooey, ukulele. Wait a minute, meatball. It's mm. ooey, ooey, ooka, ooka, ooka. Uh, uh, Arthur, you sound like a Ford car. Uh, You'll be uh, driving uh, a Nash uh, uh, Rambler if you don't quit messing with a big name here. We call it ooey, ooey, ukulele. Is ooey, that right? Ooey, ooey, ooey. You know, Tony... Son of a gun, I haven't played my ukulele for a long time. Yes, it's been very nice that way, Arthur. I uh, hope you... Yeah, but the fans have really been been waiting for me to get back on the old I, strings. I don't think so, Arthur. I don't think that's necessary, Let Arthur. Let me see if I can finger out a little melody Arthur, here. do you have to? Let's Arthur. see now. In the blue ridge mountains of Virginia, on the trail of the lonesome pine. Arthur. In the pale moon. Let me try another tune. Do you, you care? Well, Arthur, I have no choice, Arthur. Uh, go right ahead. Right, I'm paying you. Ha, ha, Here we go. Ha, Let's, ha, with a red, red ha, robin. Let's see. All right. When the red, red robin comes bop, 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 and along, along, Better, there'll be no more robin when he starts dropping his old flea. What's, what's wrong with this machine? Arthur, think that the robin will wake right now. Playing the same two chords over and over, Arthur. Well, let's see if I can. Let's see. I'll, I'll, I'm going to try one more little tune here because it's a cute little instrument. Let me just try one more now. Let's see. All right. Here we go. Let's see. I see. On the beach at Waikiki. Uh, no, I think the little grass shack. It won't be long till I come back to my little grass shack in Hawaii. Arthur. Where the hookah, 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 hookah. Sound like that car again, Arthur. I can't see. I, I think I figured the problem out, Arthur. Which to me is the uh, ukulele is out. Uh, hand me the ukulele, Arthur, and I'll try to tune it up for you, Arthur. It's just a small case of meatball. You busted my uka uka. Come here, meatball. But Arthur was all in the interest of good programming. Uh -oh. Uh -oh.
In the Uka Uka of Virginia, at least I can't string the thing back up again. On the trail in the lonesome pine, in the pale moonlight of what's wrong with this thing? Rainbow, can you fix this thing so it'll work right? <laughs> 